Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the topic. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because this is how we make our money here at IT Impact. We have um, now 16 employees, uh, six Axis developers, two MVPs, and we're known worldwide to um, being experts in this field. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's always good to start out, I think, the year with Access User Group and how to get started then with SQL Server with Access. Giorgio had some great questions, pre-conference -pre questions, and it tells me that he's seriously uh, trying to uh, leverage this technology. All right, before we get started, a little bit about me. This is my uh, Twitter handle, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this into the comments. And Skype, please follow me on Twitter, and I'll follow you back. And uh, also, please leave me some great, great uh, feedback on this presentation. You can also link with me on LinkedIn. This is my LinkedIn, very simple, linkedin.com slash n slash Juan Soto. If you don't have a URL like that, I do encourage you to get one so that uh, people can easily follow you on LinkedIn, right? So if your name is Giorgio Rovelli, then it should be n slash Giorgio Rovelli. You have to set that up in your LinkedIn profile. This is our group. Many of you may have followed, uh, opened this conference by a link somebody mailed it to you, but if you got here by some other means, this is our Access User Groups. Please consider joining that group. When you do that, you will be able to get a notice from, um, from uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, this is the group, Lincoln Group. You get a notice from, um, from me that uh, we have a topic coming up. Also, um, we also have a group on Access User Group, which I forgot to put on here, but it's at accessusergroup.org. And I'm going to ask Lucy to put up the link for Access SQL, MS Access with SQL Server Group so that you can consider joining us on our website, accessusergroups.org. This is a labor of love. I don't get paid to doing this. It really helps me and doesn't help me with my business as much because you guys, some of you guys are, guys are direct competitors, but I welcome everybody. The more um, access developers we have that are informed and do things right, I think it benefits everybody, right? So I'm glad and excited that you made took the time to come out here and uh, be with me tonight. This is my blog, so please sign subscribe to my blog. I appreciate it. And a lot of them I'm going to talk about, a lot of what I'm going to talk about you can find here at this link, accessexperts.com slash start here. So I do encourage you to uh, visit that page um, and... Uh, we go over all those tips and articles I have there. It's just a compilation of what I feel that you need to get started in the space. We're not going to be able to touch on everything tonight, just the important stuff, but there's a much more detailed discussion on Start Here that's going to help you tremendously in terms of uh, leveraging a SQL Server. I always like to say this. I'm not an expert at SQL Server, right? Though I am as an expert on interaction between Access and SQL Server. You know, and I really applaud you. If you're interested in using SQL Server, it's a, a great technology. I always said that SQL Server Express, which we're going to talk about in a second here, was the best thing ever happened to Access. You're going to see improvements in speed. You may see improvements in speed. We'll talk about that when you might not. It's going to help you secure your data. You know, with Access 20, I think with 2013, they no longer use MDW or 2010. They stopped using MDW, which is the security technology. And MDW wasn't the most secure. There was ways to get around that. So um, every time I walk into a, a client and storing social security numbers or HIPAA information in a plain access file, I always uh, advise them to move that data to SQL Server in writing just because I don't want them to uh, lose that to any hack attempt or any employee stealing their data. Right, so I always advise them, advise them in writing. In SQL Server, we've done uh, installations with Access and SQL Server Standard Edition for up to 100 users, and it works great. And what we need, mean by Web Enable Access, what that means is you move your data to Azure, and you're still using Access. We call that Web Enabling Access. That's our terminology here in IT Impact. You may or may not agree with that, but that's what we call it. So some misconceptions that you might have about Migrating your database to SQL Server. And uh, one of the biggest misconceptions is, oh, I'll just use SQL Server Migration Assistant, which we will talk in a second, and uh, it'll create the database for me in my tables, and I'm done. Like the other day, I was 
uh, interviewing a, a senior access developer. I'd known him for many years, and uh, I was interviewing him for a position at my firm. And I said, do you know, do you use SQL Server? Because I want to hire somebody who has SQL Server experience. Oh, yeah, use SQL Server all the time. Oh, great. It's on. Yep, yep. And I said, well, uh, how much SQL Server do you use? Well, I, I use the tables. The SQL Server, great. And then I didn't hear anything else. I mean, he wasn't using views or store procedures or data sets or anything. He just strictly was using tables. And, you know, God bless him. That worked for him all these years. But unfortunately, uh, to really maximize the relationship here, you really need to do more than what uh, the uh, just tables. Uh, yes, so Azure and SQL Server are the same thing. That's a good question, Giorgio. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a little difference, right, when you move your data to Azure. That is, uh, you can't, for example, edit table structures or add fields with the GUI. You have to use what they call DDL commands, data, data layer commands. And uh, that's a SQL syntax to add a field, right? So uh, you would find a syntax to add a field to your database using SQL, and you execute that in the query. That's how you manage your tables in uh, Azure. Probably not the easiest way, but still doable. So uh, one of the other biggest misconceptions is that you're always going to end up better than what you started with. Well, you can. In my case, we always do. That's because we're going to uh, talk about how to avoid those pitfalls here during this session. And so um, first things first, you know, I told you you can uh, go to start here for a collection of tips. A lot of what we're going to talk about is there. So one of the things you're probably going to have to decide is which version of SQL Server you really want. Uh, you can find, if, you, if you're, if you for example, a consultant and your client already has SQL Server, use that one. And it could be SQL Server 2008. It really, it really doesn't matter. SQL Server is going to do so much better for you than using plain access. I don't care what version of SQL Server you use, as long as you use SQL Server, I'm, I, you'll, you'll be fine. Otherwise, what you want to do is get the SQL Server Express. Now, you could, your client could end up paying $12,000 and get SQL Server Standard Edition, but they're already in Access. Think about this, right? They're already in Microsoft Access. They're using Access. And so going from Access to SQL Server Express is like going from a bicycle to a car. I mean, it really is no comparison. SQL Server Express runs, runs circles around Access when it's configured right. So um, to get SQL Server Express, you can just get the latest version of 2016 here at this link, which I will proceed to paste in LinkedIn um, and the Skype, excuse me, here. And uh, the next thing you're going to need is you're going to need SQL Server Management Studio. So think of SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio, as the abbreviation, as the, um, as the uh, tool that you're going to use to manage your server so you can stop the server, you can start the server, you can add new databases, add new tables. You're going to be living in Management Studio when you're working with a SQL Server project. So I'm going to send you, they recently separated it, by the way. So it's a separate download. It used to be you get SQL Server Management Studio installed with SQL Express. Now they separated it. And uh, I do advise you to use SSMS no matter what version of SQL Server. So if your client says, hey, we got uh, SQL Server 2008, go ahead and download the latest version of SQL Server Management Studio because it will work with any version of SQL Server. And the next two downloads are, are, are required in my book, uh, which is the SQL Server Native Client. Here's a link to really optimize uh, the speed between Access and SQL Server. Um, yeah, you still need Access for the front end. Good, good point, George. When you, we run some circles around Access, but you still need Access the front end, right? So Access the presentation layer. So SQL Server native client is what's going to give you the best bang for your buck. You could use the native SQL Server driver that comes with every Windows station, but that's like holding your SQL Server back. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you install this client at every computer that's going to be using your application. Now, there's two versions of SQL Server in the client. Most likely, you'll be installing the 64-bit version because that's what most everybody's on in terms of their Windows, right? Windows 8, Windows 10 is uh, Windows 7 64-bit, right? So if they're using 64-bit Windows, install a 64-bit native client. If they're using 32-bit Windows, 
Use the 32-bit data client, so you're covered everywhere. One of the best tools to get started with a SQL Server with uh, Access project is SQL Server Migration Assistant for Access, SSMA. You can download the latest version with this link, which I also will copy, into Skype here. This is a wonderful tool. It's going to do a lot of your heavy lifting. Before we get to that, I just want to talk about limitations of Express. Your databases on SQL Server can no, cannot exceed 10 gigabytes. Now think about this a second. You know that the, you may not know that the uh, limit for access is 2 gigabytes, right? The file size can be 2 gigabytes. As you approach 2 gigabytes, the performance deteriorates significantly. Now let's say, for example, worst case scenario, you have a 2 gigabyte access database that will not translate into a 2 gigabyte SQL Server database. That may translate maybe into less than a gig. The reason being is SQL Server is much better as storing the means that 10 gigabytes of hard drive space on SQL Server, we're probably looking at millions and millions of rows of data based on, of course, the design of your database. Now, I have had clients using SQL Server Express for many years now. They still have not outrun its usefulness. And let's face it, if your business grows to millions and millions of rows, you probably should get standard edition anyway. But a lot of our clients, hey, you know, they, they have hundreds of thousands of rows of data. They're never going to exceed SQL Server Express. Now, obviously, Microsoft would like you to buy the full version of SQL Server. So they limit Express to 1 gig of RAM, only one process. So a lot of times I get a question from my client. It says, well, one, um, what server should you get? I said, yeah, I'll tell them yes. No, I mean, what, ser what server should I get? I says, no, I said, yes, get any server that you can afford, whatever your budget allows, because anything you buy is going to be fine for SQL Server Express. Now, sometimes they want to buy a server because they want to use it in a file server. They want to use it for other things, and that's, that will dictate the equipment, the requirements of the server, how many processors, gigs of RAM, and so and hard drive right, technology they use, right? RAID 10, RAID 5. So, um, but basically, any server you buy from a cheap $1,200 server up to several thousand. Now, you know, Microsoft says there's a limitation. I have noticed a difference. And I always tell my clients, you know, get at least 8 gigs of RAM. I know it only uses 1 gig, and you're only going to use the server for SQL Server Express. But I really recommend to get uh, 8 gigs. And every processor pretty much you buy these days is going to have more than one processor. Given these limitations, you're still running circles around access. Now, before you, you dive ahead first into into this project of upgrading access to SQL Server, and by the way, I don't really want to dissuade you from doing this. This is a wonderful solution that's going to improve your life, the quality of your life tremendously, and the quality of the business that you're working with tremendously. And I don't want you to dissuade you oh, all these issues and slowness. No, this is all doable. And all it takes is one project to learn this stuff and then apply these principles to your second, third, and fourth project. This is not a uh, two-year learning curve. This is a one project learning curve. Once you apply the knowledge that, I'm going to, um, uh, that you're going to hear today and at start, at start here, the link I sent you earlier, you should be fine to head down that path of being able to do SQL Server with access and overcome the issues. And it's going to be a great learning process. If you're anything like me where I love to learn new things and you're going to love SQL Server, getting to know it well and learning to SQL. But before you get started, before you do anything else, you got to fix problems with access. So, for example, if a client tells you, well, you know, this report is taking 45 minutes to run, believe it or not, it may take longer on SQL Server for reasons I'll explain in a bit. Or if they're having problems with uh, uh, data integrity, you're going to have data integrity problems in SQL Server, right? If they have poorly designed tables, those poorly designed tables will exacerbate, I hope I pronounced that right, the SQL Server database. So you really got to do good in terms of fixing issues you encounter with access before you head first into this, uh, into this uh, avenue, new avenue in your life. 
Fix these issues because otherwise they will cause problems later. All right, great. So um, SQL Server Management Integration Assistant is a tool that's going to allow you to create your database, SQL Server, create the tables, and create views. I usually don't bother. I'll explain to you in a second. It creates indexes, adds row version uh, type data types to every table, which is necessary. What happens is the way Access knows that there's a new change or record is through the row version uh, type field type. And every one of your tables should have that. It's a special field. We don't use it for anything in Access. We don't use it for queries. We don't use it for forms. We don't use any reports. It's just an internal mechanism that's used between Access and SQL Server to tell if you have problem issues with if you have new versions of the database records. So sometimes what I have is I'll get a customer calls me who did the upgrade themselves to SQL Server, and they don't have row versions. So one, you know, I get this your message a lot saying you and another user have edited this record. You like to a copy the record to memory, b discard your changes, which, uh, you know, I hate that dialog box. And those of you who have heard this before know me. I don't really appreciate that dialog box. It really is useless. But you get a lot of that. You probably want to make sure that they have row version data field types in your tables. SSMA does know, for example, that you need to have your bit default fields set to um, to zero, not no. Sorry, that's my, my bad. Now, but there is no true false field in SQL Server, uh, so you got to use uh, bit data types. You can use other technologies. Armin Stein does not like use bit uh, bit field types. He has a whole blog post on that. You may want to look it up. Bit fields, Armin Stein at J Street Technology. But I like using bit fields because they um, allow to do the check mark right in Access. And it's either true or false, zero or one, right? And so one of the things you'll quickly know in, in SQL Server, bit fields are either zero or one, and not zero and negative one like on Access. So when you look at the data, excuse me, let's say, for example, you look at your table in Access. <coughs> oh, heavens. You'll see minus one in Access, but when you query the table in SQL Server, it'll say zero, it'll say one, right, for true. <laughs> so the ODBC driver is converting that one to minus one, so the axe can function, the jet engine can function with that. One of the great features of SQL Server Migration Assistant, and by the way, we have uh, done sessions on SSMA. <laughs> if you go to Access User Groups and do a search, you'll see search for SSMA. Now I'm going to show you how to quickly search in in Google. I train all my employees, so new employees to do this. I'm called hacking the planet. I'll say, okay, SSMA, and then I do the site keyword, access user groups, <coughs> org. <coughs> and uh, here you get, ban uh, you get, you get uh, it defaults, when you use the site keyword, it forces Google to search that specific site, right? So um, Maria Barnes from lunchtime covered this topic. And... Um, Here's a whole video on migration assistant that you should see. So there's um, there's a wonderful uh, wonderful information on accessusergroups.org as well as on our main website accessexperts.com slash blog. So after you've done that initial data upload and create your database, one of the things that you quickly realize is that uh, when you add additional tables, right? So if you did the initial conversion. The SQL Server. Now you're going to add new feed, new tables in SQL Server for whatever reason. You, you decide you need new tables. When you design those tables in SQL Server, it's not automatically going to create your foreign keys. Not, you know how in Access, anything that has ID at the end of the field name automatically adds an index, right? Not in SQL Server. You have to define those explicitly. So just keep that in mind that any uh, foreign keys that you add, you have to add those yourself, right, to any tables uh, in your database. And then one of the really nicest thing about SQL Server Migration Assistant is when we go through a um, a project, we have an alpha version where I'll ask my client at the beginning of the project, can I get your latest backend and I use that to migrate, right? Then I come back with an alpha version. What before? Right before I give them the alpha version, I ask for another copy of their backend, and then I use SSMA to upload 
their latest data, right? So in this summary, there's a uh, you right click on the on the access database object and you'll say refresh data, and it'll refresh the data from that backend. So it deletes the old data, replaces it with the new data automatically. I do the same thing for beta and final rollout. Final rollout, of course, is most critical where you ask them for their final backend and then you upload them. A lot of times when you're migrating database, see, the discussion here so far is centered around migrating existing solutions, but if you're starting from scratch, you won't have these issues, right? If you're starting from scratch, you won't need a backend, right? And you probably won't use SSMA because there is no access database to upgrade. But when you're upgrading the system, that there's already in use, it's a mission critical system most most of all the time, and they're already using it. They're not going to stop using it while you spend several weeks to design the new version of SQL Server. So it's always important that you have a final rollout plan. I've actually touched upon this in other sessions where we talk about how to cut over uh, from uh, a access database to a SQL Server database and. Make sure you have an emergency plan in place and when to cut over, which usually is on a Friday afternoon, so you have the weekend to work on any last minute issues and how do you know all the data migrated over and so on. So it's like we can devote and we have devoted a lot to um, to this topic of uh, managing a project, right? But this is introduction, so I don't want to get too carried away. All right, so this is some of the things that, uh, and I touched already about this, right? Uh, tables with no indexes. No former keys in your access database, complex primary keys. You know, I get the real kick out of clients who tell me, uh, you know, we create this system where if you look at the primary key, we know when the order was created and what date and which client region. And, you know, they have this whole logic that they, everybody in the organization knows, right? So I'm not going to change that. If you have a complex primary key that helps your business, great. God bless you, man. But what I am going to do, however, is I'm going to continue with your primary keys, but I'm going to add my own keys that are purely numeric in SQL Server because I, for one, am not looking forward to dealing with complex primary keys that mean things to my client. So almost 100% of the time, we just add our own primary keys, they're auto increment uh, integers, and then we have a secondary primary key, which is for show only, that the user sees, right? So everybody continues to think that they're seeing they don't know that internally that has a number associated with that record. All right, remember earlier I told you about how SSMA will convert your queries? There are several exceptions to that. SSMA will convert your query to views. Now, think of views as queries in SQL Server. They're just called views, right? They're not called queries, but we call them the same thing. So uh, this SSMA will create these views for you if you let it under certain conditions. Number one, uh, if the query doesn't use a function key, a function, excuse me, has either a column or a uh, criteria, it'll convert the query over, right? So if uh, if it doesn't use temp bars, if, you know, there's all kinds of things, lots of gotchas, right, that the uh, SSMA will not convert the query to view. So I, what we've done is we just don't convert any queries to views automatically. And then well, after SSMA, has done through its thing, has done gone through its thing. We then um, we then go through all the queries and use the access database. And so that leads me to my next topic, which I don't have a slide for, and that is you're really going to be doing rounds of optimization. So think about it. The first time you upload that database to SQL Server, you're going to measure the performance of the access database. Okay, let's just use this. Maybe. You know, maybe this first time around, everything is hunky-dory and it's going to be work faster or better. Usually not the case 100% of the time, right? You may come across a report that's taking longer, you know, in, in a query that takes longer than it was before. So your job is to, uh, your job is to, um, let me sign up my cell phone there. That's my cell phone using a Star Trek, Star Trek thingy. All right, so your job is to, you know, fix these issues you're going to have with these queries. So let me just address each one of those instances for you. All right, and maybe I should just document this, right? Handling queries as I'm talking about this. All right, so here, 
query uses a custom function. Well, first of all, like I said, you test your queries. And if they're running fine, you don't do anything, right? Test all of your all of your queries and reports, right? And uh, reports don't touch don't touch the ones that work fine, right? Not everything has to be converted over to a view of SQL Server. Is my point. The second thing is if uh, if it uses a custom function, it may still work well. But if it doesn't, then you need to convert that to a view, which in turn then becomes a per, uh, a query with a criteria when you access the database, right? So if you're having a, if you have you know you may have a query that uses a very complex function that goes and determines a whole series of things only to come up with a query criteria for your query, right? At the end of the line, it says, okay, this is your criteria. And I've seen cases like that. And those are not easy. So when you have something like that, then you may have to convert it over to a store procedure. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just get weak in the knees when they hear store procedures. But they're, I find that I found it really great to learn it and... Uh, the IntelliSense was wonderful, and I think the language is very easy to learn. I don't think you're having issues at all picking up T-SQL. We call it T-SQL is what you use to create store procedures. The T and T-SQL mean something. i just blanking out right now. But uh, T-SQL is what Microsoft calls it. Uh, SQL ANSI is a standard course. T-SQL is not part of SQL ANSI. And you can use T-SQL to do anything. Create databases, drop databases, uh, Create views with T-SQL. You can do anything you can do with the GUI, you can do with T-SQL, all right? So it's just a really powerful language in SQL Server. But when you have a, when you have a function, for example, it uses the temp bar. That temp bar is, is something that you may send your code, right? So say, for example, I have a report that I launch that uses basically, that's using a query, then turn uses the temp bar that I set. And I want to run this report, this invoice, right? So I have an invoice report. And the temp bar dictates which invoice I'm going to see for what client. So I might be at the client screen for that invoice screen, and then the the cluster user wants to print out the invoice. I need to launch the query invoice um, invoice report, and I'm using a temp bar, which is perfectly fine. Instead of using the where clause of the do command open report, right? The criteria of the do command open report that will need to be converted over to a regular query, and either using the do command open report criteria or Set your temp bar into code and not in the query itself. If you want to use a view in SQL Server, now views are wonderful. And the reason I, I don't want to scare you about views, but views you're going to need to use views in order to maximize the relationship with uh, SQL Server and access. And the reason being is you want the server to do the heavy lifting. All right, think about this: you have this really big query. It's got ten reports, all kinds of joins. I mean, I mean, it's got 10 tables, right? And all kinds of joins, left auto join, inner auto join. And now the data is located in a SQL Server. If you have a complex query that Access cannot hand off to the server, what happens? Access then requests all that data, gets downloaded to that client PC, and the query occurs on the Access client, which in my, my, my book is the ultimate sin. It should never get to that point where access is doing the heavy lifting at all. And so, and it doesn't have to be a complex query. Think about the next scenario where you have, for example, a states table, right? I mean, we all have state tables in most of our applications. It's just a list of states, 50 states and their territories. Well, uh, don't make the mistake of having that on the local machine and then doing a query with what we call a hybrid query with a SQL Server table has the order field and the state tables and access. Now you do a query. When you do a hybrid query like that, it forces all the data down to access because the SQL Server does not have the states table. So you can't you can't really run the query in SQL Server because the SQL Server receives a query from access. I don't have the state table here. Here's the data. You handle it. You do this query. So you want to stay away from situations where you have hybrid queries where you're using local tables and SQL Server tables together. Sometimes it's unavoidable. It happens to me. It may happen to me today. I have to create a hybrid query to update a table. But you want to stay away from them.
So when you have a query that's, um, in that case, by the way, the state table, you just go ahead, go ahead and create a state table on the SQL Server. So you have a state table on SQL Server, and you have a state table on your local access front end, and you use that local front end table, state table, and any combo, and any kind of drop down boxes, right, for states. So you don't want to fetch all the states every time you need to read them in the combo box on the SQL Server. Just make a local table for states and have another local table on SQL Server so that the SQL Server can handle the queries. Bottom line is, you need views in order to be able to maximize this relationship and offload all that work to the SQL Server. Now, there is some wonderful benefits of creating views in SQL Server. It's going to help you about your bottom line in terms of speed. Number one is, there's a, what's, what's called execution plan. Every view has an execution plan. What it is, is just a plan that SQL Server creates to optimize the query of that data. So when you design a view in SQL Server and you save that view, for the first time, it, the first time that view is created, SQL Server will create the, a corresponding query plan that says you're going to query these tables, and you're going to look through these tables, and finally you're going to use the results. That query plan then gets optimized the more you use that table, that view, excuse me. That query plan gets automatically optimized. Now, what happens is if it's a really popular view in your application, such as, for example, list of open orders, that thing may, may be called upon everywhere in your application. It may be called upon at the customer record. I have a tab of open orders, right? It might be called upon a, a queue form where I have a queue of open orders. It may be called upon a report. Now, you're calling that view constantly. Open orders view. Well, SQL Server notices that. It says, hey, I'm going to save this in memory. I'm going to save this view in memory. I'm going to save this, this, um, this query plan in memory. So the next time you call that, that view, it's actually running from memory. It's not reading off the server hard drive. Now, that's where you go back to the one gig limit, right? So it's got to do trade-offs. It automatically manages all that for you in the memory of the SQL Server. When you have a standard edition SQL Server that can use a lot more memory, then you can load a lot more views into memory, into, into, into memory and it will ha speed up things. So when I have a client that calls me up and say, after a few years of using my app, says, hey, Juan, you know, when we first started, it was working great, but now over time, you know, this is less and less. Says, well, you know, first thing I'll take a look is how big their, their tables have been. I'll look at the query optimization plans and see if the server is choking on any of these queries, right, these, uh, these uh, query plans. And I'll get back to them and says, look, it looks like you need to migrate to standard edition. You know, guess what? Your sales will grow 100% year over year. You need to spend some money in SQL Server standard edition or migrate the application to Azure, but that causes other issues such as latency. So bottom line is use views to speed up things on your access front end. And you can use a view for reports, you can use a view in your code to do analysis, right? Here's the, you tell SQL Server, okay, you query SQL Server with the easy ADODB, and I'm going to put a comment on that in my comments here. Look it up on my website blog, it's easy ODDB. You can use that technology that I developed, and uh, you can search Google for easy ODB, it'll come up. And uh, use that views in your code to um, to get results, right? To find out what to do next. And so get good at doing views. Now, a lot of times, if there are simple queries in Access, they will automatically translate. So a lot of times, when I first started out with Access, I would use the Access Query Designer to create my query, and then I would right-click, use the SQL view, copy that SQL view over to SQL Server. And SQL Server migration that says well, SQL Server Management Studio and create my view that way. But that's only in the most simplest cases. For example, an insert query will not work translate that easily. So in the most simpler SQL query most simple select statements will translate fine. Otherwise you have to re you have to build your query from scratch using SQL Server Migration Assistant and the uh, GUI interface and, and uh, SSMS, sorry, not Microsoft SSMS. I'm, I'm confusing my terms here. All right, and then, um, so, you know, it's just, uh, it's just uh, a wonderful tool set that you're going to be developing here for yourself. What was the other thing? Oh, Azure. 
when you're dealing with Azure, you just introduce a whole new wrench into your design. Right? Think about it. You you may have had a local SQL server on a local network. A local network these days is a gigabyte, gigabit speed, right? If you uh, if you're if you're anything like me, the best I have in my office is uh, uh, 50 megabytes per second instead of one gigabyte per second, which is my local network. So when you go from one gigabyte to 50 gig 50 megabytes per second. Or even a T1 was one megabyte per second. I remember that was the whole rage, all the whole other rage back in the day. You know, you you really need to factor that latency involved, and you even need to rely more on the server. The server needs to do more queries and more views and more store procedures, which is one of the keys to um, migrating to Azure. Is that you have to flow more, more and more work off the SQL Server. Now earlier earlier in the discussion, I talked about rounds of optimization. And so what usually happens is I'm not usually the guy who's using their application day in day out, right? So they'll ask me to upgrade their database. I'll do I'll, I'll upgrade to their database. I see how they use it more or less. I do my little testing. Then I hand it over to them. I, I hand them an alpha version. So okay, here, here's my first time that I play. I want you to use it and report back to me where there's issues so I can fine tune it. One of the reasons we do it that way is I tell my employees because speed is subjective. Right, I might be. I may very well think that it's slow. Oh my gosh, it took four seconds. And my client might call me back and says, "Juan, what do you do? It's four seconds, man. This is great." You know, it could have been that when they had an access, it was thirty seconds. To me, four seconds is an eternity. Right, one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, one thousand four. My client calls me up and says, "Oh my gosh." You know, the best thing is to slice bread. You got it down to four seconds. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, if he's happy with that, who am I to say, you know, let's go ahead and optimize it further to one second. But then again, like I said, speed is subjective. They might say, you know, four seconds is too long. We need to get this down. And there's only so many things you can do to get that down, right? You can use temporary table SQL Server. You can use store procedure. You can use data sets. You can, you know, it's an elliptical curve where your, your time involves your time involved gives you less and less results, right, in terms of speed and performance. So it's an elliptical curve there where the amount of effort you put in gives you less and less return on investment. And I make the client aware of that in my proposal. I say, we're going to do rounds of improvement where eventually we're going to hit speed walls. And you're going to need to decide, do you want to spend more money to optimize this these views and these queries and these store procedures, or do you rather live with it? Now, I'm a big fan. If I've got a customer on the phone, right? Say, for example, I'm doing an app for the customer service department at a company, and they got a customer on the phone. I'm not going to let that customer wait for 30 seconds because the, because I decided that 30 seconds was enough. Hell no. I mean, four seconds. I just cut down four seconds to you. That can be an attorney on the uh, I mean, 30 seconds can be an attorney on the phone. So we need, definitely need to see the context, right? And I'll ask the client, say, look, you know, this report takes 30 seconds on your server. It used to take a minute and a half in access. I got it down to 30 seconds. Are you okay with that? Or do you want me to further optimize? And they might say, you know what, no problem. You know, I'll, I'll launch a report. I'll check my email while it's running. I'll go fetch a cup of coffee. I'll go use the restroom, come back, and it'll be fine. That's not a problem. Don't spend your money on that. i got other things I want you to do because, again, you're the best things in sliced bread. I want you to use, you, use your time judiciously because I'm not cheap. So it goes through like that where you hand it, then you go to the alpha, then you go to the beta. Same thing, right? They fix the issues that we found in alpha, and they further refine, tell me more, more issues. We have a beta. I fixed those and I explained to them about the rounds of optimization. So we can put more time to it, but it's going to cost you more because it takes us long, longer to optimize it until the client is happy and we do the rollout. So um, that's pretty much it. The only other thing I have to do is you really need to, if you really want to up your game, right? So say for example you want to come work for me. If you want to come work for us, and be a consultant because we only hire consultants. That's the topic for another day. We don't ask, we don't hire developers. We hire consultants. But you want to work for us. You really need to learn how to store, create store procedures, and you really need to learn how to do data sets and instead of nested views. You know how in, in Access you have nested queries where you have one query that does an operation, then you you design a second query that's based off the first query, then you design the third query. 
of the second query, and then you you know you may have five six queries one after the other, and the only one you really execute is the last query in that chain, right? The query number six or seven, whoever the last one is, and that one then turns calls the other ones until you finally do it. Well, that's a big no-no in SQL Server. And again, uh, if uh, if you do have something like that with nested views, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It does work. You can create view one, view two, view three, and then view four is a compilation of all the prior views that will work. But if you really, if you you have a client that's complaining that it's still too slow, you have to migrate that to data sets, which is beyond the discussion of this. But we'll definitely take a look at this this year in 2017. We're going to revisit all these topics again, more so with detail. SQL Server Migration Assistant, SSMS, T-SQL, and data sets as topics I have lined up for the rest of the year. All right, that's it for me. Now we're going to open up to discussions, I mean, to questions, comments, criticisms, or feedback from you guys. So the floor is yours. This is where you say whatever you like to say. The only thing I can think of is that uh, it's a good idea, that hybrid with the state table. I would have oh, yes. thought of that. That is yeah. a great idea. Yeah, duality of tables. I mean, the state table never changes, right? We're not, gonna, we're not creating states every month that you're on here. Exactly. And there are other things. I mean, I, I, I put in sometimes even I mean, once we, invade or, Mexi yeah. once we invade Mexico in March and we annex them as a state, yeah, we're going to need to change our state tables. And so you change it in both places. What's the big deal? <laughs> you missed my whole joke about President Trump invading Mexico and then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, everything's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So somebody has a question here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. At, at what point, you know, you're looking at a system that um, I have a database that I'm I need to move to uh, a SQL SQL backend, um, and I guess my decision is going to be, uh, do I try to migrate those tables um, to SQL or they say you've got to fix the problems in them are you better off just building the tables redesigning it and building them as SQL tables no the reason being is you lose the ability to update the data through the alpha beta roll-up versions right so I mean sometimes throughout the project we're updating that data constantly once a day sometimes uh, as we're doing as we're getting closer and closer to rollout and they need to see the, the customer needs to see the latest data, right? Because they don't know if it's right. So they run the report, an open order report. What are they going to do? They want to they want to compare that to their access version. And if they see that there's a discrepancy, they want to know. They'll tell you, say, hey, Juan, you're short a thousand dollars. Well, that's because I don't have the latest data in SQL Server. So what you want to do is to address those issues in access first, and then use SSMA to create the database. Okay. Reports is the way how you validate, it, right? In other words, you cut them over to the SQL Server. How do they know that? How do they know that you cut over all the data? How do they know that all the data migrated over? So what I tell them is, we run that's going to reports is where our baseline is. We do several checks. We first of all we check the number of records and access versus number of records in SQL Server they need to be identical. And then we do reports, and they all have to match. If they don't match, we don't go live until we can figure out why they don't match. A mm. lot of times, believe it or not, I've addressed an issue with the design that was causing them erroneous report in access. I, yeah, I believe that. And so it ends up being it ends up being a situation where we have to fix the access version so that they can match both of them. Is this going to be your first uh, t attempt to using SQL Server? Uh, it's going to be the first time I've uh, worked, I've built a, a SQL Server backend. Oh, I remember my I first. With databases that already have it. I remember my first time was a web-enabled version where I have to, took them to the web. And, I mean, I was learning this stuff, and I had the latency issue I had to deal with. That was were fun times. Hmm. You know, when I first started, there was no not a lot of information. There is a book out there that I use a lot. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's out, it's uh, really old now. I think it was 2000 or 2003 SQL Server. Still a lot of that applies. And, uh, but I, started, I decided to start the blog because there wasn't a lot of information on how to optimize access to SQL Server. And what was the book? 
The book. I knew you were going to ask me about the book. All right. <laughs> well, I've got my pen poised here to write it down. All right. Here we go. Amazon. I thought about creating my own book uh, and uh, doing that. Let's see. Access SQL Server. Here it is. Microsoft Apps Developer Guide SQL Server, December 2000. Okay. Let me uh, send you the link here. And, and Skype, and Skype. I mean, it was a great book. It's got a lot of user information, but a lot of some of that stuff, you know, they've since moved on. And I've always said to myself, today, this is the year I'm going to do my book. This is the year. This is it for sure. That was four years ago. <laughs> and every year, my resolution is like, I do the book. I actually started writing the book, had a couple pages down, and then, I mean, it's just hectic with my practice and everything else going on in my life. You know, I'm, I'm doing this, but I, I really need to be disciplined. And I see the, I, you know, God bless these authors. I've seen how Ben, he just released a new book. Ben, who's a um, architect, our most senior employee here at IT Impact. Uh, let me just show you about this. this. This is also a great book. This is also designed by Access Developers. Just came out fresh off the process, so I encourage you to get this one. Great book. And um, there's the Skype link there for that, so you can uh, you can definitely save a few bucks with the used version. And um, one of the things is uh, here, the, all these three guys are Access guys: John, Doug, Doug and Ben. Are both uh, all three of them are access guys, so it's access for SQL. Great. No, you know, there's nothing in so my book would be a, again the treatise, treatise on how to optimize access to SQL Server, but this is just effective SQL. Over the years, I've encountered some very complex queries where um, I need to um, determine the top sales of every sales guy in every region, right? The first top 10 sales, mm -hmm. right? The best top 10 sales of every sales guy in every region. Those are called strawberry queries. Have you heard of that? Strawberry queries? Yeah, look it up. Strawberry query. Never heard of it. No. Strawberry query on my blog, and you'll see it. Let me just do it now. Let's see here. Fascinating concept. I mean, some of these query concepts are very uh, are very high end, but they really help you in the jam. So um, here, find the maximum minimum use in SQL Server. Let me go ahead and give you this link as well. Just uh, wonderful uh, trustees on the subject. It's just uh, just goes to show you know, and we both can head out to design a query to receive the same results as now queries will be different. You know as well as I do, they could be different. There's all kinds of ways to do queries, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To achieve the same results. But uh, this is something that may may help you out in the future. So I just encourage you to to read up on that. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing it doesn't have to relate with this topic. One of the things we've been doing is we've been creating videos for our clients on how to use the applications. And if you have Windows 10, have you heard of? Windows 10 uh, Gamer Mode. If you hold the window key and press G for games, it'll come up on your computer so that you can record videos. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, use that to uh, to uh, document your database. So it's more. It's you know used to be you have to buy a program several hundred dollars, but uh, yeah. Windows Gamer Mode. I encourage you guys to look into that. Just a great way. Gamer mode. It's a great way to uh, it's a game mode that focuses your rigs. You know, so in gamer mode, it talks about here. But this uh, this allows you to record the screen, right? They use this for gamer guys to record their kill shots, but we use it to <laughs> record training videos. All right. Did you guys like the discussion? Did you guys like what I said that to say? Yeah, yeah it was very helpful. Hey, can you hear me, Juan? Yes, go ahead. Um, I ha <clears throat> I had typed in a question a little bit a little bit earlier, but I, I've been ignored. <laughs> um, the um, the question was, can you go? Can you migrate directly from Access to 
SQL Server Express using SSMA. Yes, that's exactly what SMA does, right? It does SQL Server Migration Assistant allows you to upgrade to any version of SQL Server Express, Standard, Enterprise, anything. Okay, because we, we had a problem where I was working, and it, um, it didn't allow you to... It, it, it allowed you to go to the full SQL Server, but not to SQL Server Express. So. No, we do it all the time. I mean, we just finished a project for a company in Tennessee where we migrated 35 of their Access database. It took us a year. Uh, it's, a, it's a factory that was using Access for everything. Yeah. And uh, we used, we used if it weren't for SSMA, I would have pulled my, the rest of my hair out. I don't have much hair left. <laughs> But I would have pulled the rest of it off because uh, it just really, really is a godsend. It's a great tool. You know, in the old days, you could, I don't know if you guys remember this, but in the old version of Access, it allow you to upgrade SQL Server. With Access would do it for you. But um, has SQL Server changed? It never got updated, and it got dropped from Access altogether. Mm. The other aspect of this, the SQL Server, uh, SQL Server Management Studio does allow you to import data. Uh, so you don't have to use SSMA. You could use uh, Management Studio, but you need to be careful because it was designed for MDB, not ACCDB. And so you have to do all kinds of things to. And this very well documented. You have to install the engine, the Jet engine, the Ace engine, uh, in your rig and your in your PC to get that to import. But uh, I just don't bother with that. I just use SSMA. Well, I'm glad you liked the uh, presentation. You know, this is a labor of love, and the only thing I ask you guys for before you before you leave, please, please go into my LinkedIn SQL Server group and leave feedback on today's topic by commenting on the post I have there. Tweet about it. Always great if you guys can tweet how much how much you liked it and how much you didn't like it. I mean, I don't care. Just tweet about it. You know, if you didn't like it, you hated it. Say it. If you loved it, you liked it. Say it that too. I really am neutral about that but it really would appreciate it if you guys can go on your social networks we have a facebook page access facebook page access user group facebook page that you can also visit and leave feedback or even on my uh, linkedin profile leave feedback so uh, that's all i ask this humble servant next month is um, february and let me see i'm going to have a trip planned for a super secret location in the caribbean i can't let me see if that's uh going to conflict Second, so yeah, I won't be here next month. It won't be. I might have Ben then do next month, and he might uh, talk about data sets. I think he'd be great at that, and he also can talk about his new book and how uh, some of the process he went through. That I think that'd be a great session. What do you guys think? Yes. Would you like to hear from the author himself, the man, the legend? Absolutely. All right. So but you're see. very good too. Don't don't put yourself down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Lucy, please book Ben for next month, and uh, it'll be a book promotion. And we got to figure out a way where you can sign your copies. That would be great <laughs> if you guys can get signed copies. Maybe if you order the okay. book through him for a few more dollars, you can get signed copies. But uh, yeah. Ben is a wonderful resource, so please query him and uh, do that. Then we'll do – I'm sorry? <laughs> you can buy the book for one penny used. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so the other aspect of this, uh, I'll be back in March with Full Force. Um, I am trying to book somebody from the Access team this year. So wish me luck on that. Oh, great. Yes. See if we can get somebody from the Access team. How are they you know, doing? I, I, I accidentally missed your meeting last uh, month. I, I, forgot to, I took a nap and forgot to set an alarm. But um, the thing is, um, are they seriously going to... Upgrade access? I mean, all the stuff you're sending sounds like they're really trying to take it seriously. This is a new group that started uh, two years ago, and uh -huh. I've been excited for I've been a Nexus MVP for going on six years now, and uh, this these guys get it. They really are committed to the product. They love the product. A lot of people who came back who started with access, they're back in the team. Uh, they got some great stuff planned for you guys, which, which I can't tell because I always have to give you my give them my firstborn. <laughs> but, well, the uh, thing is this: Do they use it? Because my sense of a lot of what happened was that the people who were writing Access did not use it. I can't comment on that. That's NDA information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Read what you will. My no comment. 
All right. <laughs> Look, um, Microsoft is cool again. And if I want, I want to leave you one anecdote before we finish tonight. Sure. And that is, um, since Sadea Nadella took the reins of Microsoft, his thing is let the data drive your business decisions. And you've noticed a lot of radical things have happened. First of all, when he started with Microsoft, right away you saw Office on the iPad. You never would see that with the old regimen. Right. You know, be, now I can, I'm, I'm in the field. I take my iPad. I don't even bother with my laptop sometimes. I just, I've got a quick meeting. I take my iPad. I can open documents, edit them, and Word for iPad and Excel for iPad. The other thing is he killed off mobile phones. And the other day, I heard this anecdote where the micro, Microsoft actually uh, they had this big meeting, and the, uh, the head honcho for Office was in that meeting. I mean, you're talking about a room full of managers, dozens and dozens of people, and one of the topics was the access videos. And when he heard it, when he saw that, the agenda says, "What do you mean access videos? How come we're spending money on teaching people how to use access? Why are we not doing that for SharePoint or Word or Excel?" We got people clamoring for that all the time. And they said, nope, Shax Access Videos is the number one request that we're getting from our corporate and users worldwide. Oh, okay. And that was the end of the discussion. The data drives the organization now. And so, um, and the data is showing that, they showed that huge interest. And that's why D-based support is coming back because of user voice and the data that they're collecting from user voice. If there's one thing that you guys can do to improve proof of access, because I heard this constantly when I met with the team in November at the Microsoft campus, is they listen to what you type in user voice. They love that forum. And you got to go out there and you got to make your mark on that user voice. Vote for the stuff that matters to you. Create new topics, if you will. They look at everything. Do you know how they look at? They look at the feedback you leave in help articles. I uh, raised my hand and uh, really said, you know, do? They, I, they I, do. I, stopped, I stopped putting data in. No, no, I, no. I no, they were no, just they, filing in the circular file. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I was so upset with a help article. I actually wrote, this is useless. And because I was logged in, yeah. you know, they knew it was me. And then I raised my hand and said, you know, the other day I left a comment. You guys, oh, yeah, we saw your comment. This is useless. Go back to the article now. See, tell me if it's useless now. Wow, wow. <laughs> so, yes, they... Yes, uh, they used to say they ate their own dog food, and it was quite obvious they did not. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, quite not obvious. everybody... Look, look, access is not easy to use. I mean, think well, about it. that's another thing. You... Do they understand? They're still... I th are they st All right. They used to... First, they aimed it at, like, power users who can't figure it out. Then they decided the people who did Excel could learn it, which is not true. If they could learn it, they would have. Are they finally accepting the fact that Access is a real, actual database? Well, well my comment that, that was... companies is, actually run on it? Yes, yes. I tell you, I can't tell you why I say that, because that's under NDA. But the, okay. yes, they are listening, and I'm really uh, heartened by that. But the fact is, look, uh, one of the things, I'll give you a good example I can't talk to you about. They actually called me to say, Juan, we're going to be in Chicago. We would like to meet one of your clients. This wow. is great. Here's wow. the client. They actually, and I couldn't go with them because I was out of the town. I travel a lot. I was out of time that, that, that week. And uh, they went. They met with my client. They saw They saw how good access was. They actually saw yeah. a good example. And they, my client was impressed. And I was impressed that they took the time to to yes. meet with my clients. So they're out there talking to small businesses because that's all I cater to. I don't cater to the, to the uh, th uh, uh, you know, three, three M's of the world or IBM or uh, major, you know, Target or Walmart or anything like that. I, I cater to small businesses. Well, so um, you, can, you can cater to small businesses, but, uh, you know, also I have uh, some large clients who have departments that use the system. Yeah, so, you yeah. Know, yes, you know, and, you know, they're pretty big com customers. I mean, you know, I you know, Metro North. I mean, that's not a small company. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, you're right. So one of the things that um, yeah, I had a thought on my mind, I was going to share with you guys. But basically, yeah, there are there are listeners. A new dawn with Microsoft. Microsoft is cool again, which is the um, uh, message I drove last month. It's going to take a while to believe that. I, I'm going to have to see that. You know, what All they right. say. Uh, trust, trust. 
trust but verify. Trust but verify, exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. they still have this stupidest stuff, you know, where you can't see what you're doing or they have... Oh, well, here's what know, I was going to say. Pet- here's what I was going to say. <laughs> you know, but you know, putting access with the office was a, both a blessing and a curse. The blessing because they always tell you, oh, access is the number one database in the world. Yeah, because it gets installed with Office. Yeah. Of course, it's on all these desktops. Do they use it? That's another metric, right? But the fact is, they always say, the other aspect of this is with Word, I can launch Word. I can bang out a letter. It's not going to look great. I don't have to know anything about Word. I can just start typing. It'll automatically wiggly line, the red lines. I can figure out that I need to replace the spell, correct my spelling. I can do a word. Same thing with Excel. I can bang with a simple Excel spreadsheet. If I start access, what the heck is a form? What's a table? Well, that that's because it's not for, for people who don't know how to program. And so you ask me, do they <laughs> dog food? And then my next my, my, my question is, just like any normal company, there are folks at Microsoft who never buy it on access. They love yeah. Word, Excel. They're never going to touch Access. It right. happens with them too. Right. All right. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I'd be delighted if they actually started, you know, doing it. The, the thing is this: if they un, if they kind of could understand that Access, especially, you know, it sinks in with this uh, topic that you discussed today. Access can be a gateway to SQL. You know, it, is. it, it isn't like. It isn't like either or, you know. If 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 you you know you do something in Access and they, they start to like it and eventually they grow into SQL. So yeah, you know, it's absolutely not, right. Maybe they, hey, they so do look, that. yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. So look, uh, one of the things I guys you guys before you go, please consider attending this event. It's called Microsoft Tech Summit. It's a free event. They're coming to Chicago in uh, January, but they'll be in DC in March. Just a wonderful two-day event about Azure, which is free, lots of sessions, great labs. So yeah. if you're here in Chicago, there's one, but they're going to be also in just Google Microsoft Tech Summit. They'll be in D.C. <laughs> March 6th to the 7th. Uh, and um, looks like they're going to be in Prague and Toronto, Tel Aviv. I'm looking to see if they're going to be in Italy. But... Uh, yeah, go ahead and, and attend the event if you can. It's going to be a lot of great information. Johannesburg, Amsterdam, they're really trying to push Azure, uh, and they're doing a wonderful job of it. And one thing, okay, that's this last one, I promised me the last point that I came across is they're using Azure for everything at Microsoft. Power Apps is built on Azure. Power BI is built on Azure. If you were to remove Azure from that organization, they would die because everything is well, being built on there. Part of me would be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! But, but what is Azure? I, I used to tell them. I said, we're, "We're both working for the same thing. You, I want you to go out of business, and and you're trying to." And they said, "But you know, people said, but how would you make your living?" I said, "There's so many other better products, but while Access is around, um, you know, it's ubiquitous. You, lots of. I, I always I put it in a positive way. If I win the yeah. lottery and I forget where I am." You know, there are other people like, you know, Juan or your company or whatever who could maintain what I did. But And if I start using something, uh, you know, like uh, I think the Oracle, I haven't looked at them in a while, but like the Oracle uh, databases and Sybase has little ones and, you know, then then you're limiting how many people can help you. But, uh, boy, if they actually start, look, when I go to new clients, half the time they ask me why they can't use a Mac. Now, I would very much like them to stop asking that question. I would like them to say, you know, Microsoft is great. We love it. I haven't heard it. <laughs> let's, see if, let's see if something changes, you know. I mean, I'm well, always Ben, helpful. Ben uses a Mac. So ask Ben next month how <laughs> okay. he uses access on a Mac. And he'll tell okay. you. Okay. Well, you can do it. But, I mean, you can't, you know, I don't it's think. It's not as intuitive, yeah. You no, have to use you virtual machines and install yes, apps, and Microsoft it, it stinks. Out, yeah. It stinks. I know. I, I have clients who tried it. It just doesn't work. But the thing is, um, I, I would like them to stop asking the damn question. You know, it would be <laughs> nice if they said, you know, you know, we, we I mean, I, you know, people, have, when, the year that Enron, you know, messed everybody up in the world, Microsoft came in as number one as the worst company. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> They're changing. They're changing. That's a tough, act to, that's a tough act to follow. Well, I'd like well, to look, see it. Look, I mean, I, really I, I, I was I mean, a Mac obviously, guy. I'd love to see it. Well, I'd there was a time where I would say that the best Windows PC was a Microsoft, was a MacBook Air. 
That's yeah. how much I thought about Windows PC. But yeah. now I'm using services. I love it. Hey, guys, I really got to end it here. Thank right. you so much for coming okay. out. Take Listen, care. Don't forget to comment Thanks on again. the social. And don't forget to go on LinkedIn yeah. if you yeah, like it. Not that great at social media, but I'll make an effort for you. All right. Thank you so much, dear. <laughs> See you in March. Okay. So long, everybody. All right. Take care. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye.